As a truck goes by outside of our non-soundproofed window here at the This Week in Amateur Radio studios, we welcome you in to our 23rd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community. This is edition number 1,206, with a release and air date of Saturday, April 9th, 2022. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. Greetings and welcome to a brand new edition of This Week in Amateur Radio, your weekly venture into all things radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1206 of This Week in Amateur Radio. An amateur operator in Finland is sentenced for making on-the-air threats. We will have the details. An amateur operator in Pennsylvania is facing criminal charges. We will tell you all about that. Belgium's Amateur Radio Society, the UBA, is the latest in what seems to be a growing list of countries banning Russia and Belarus amateurs from participating in contests. Finland updates its amateur radio regulations to include encryption in certain circumstances. A worldwide paper shortage has hit the amateur radio world as national radio societies struggle to find paper to print their magazines. World Amateur Radio Day is coming up. It's Monday, April 18th. The Radio Amateurs of Canada, the RAC, announced a membership fee increase due to the ongoing inflation. And have you ever heard of the bathtub Morris key? We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, says that at first there was chaos. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how much power it takes to perform a single Google search, and he will update us on the state of the current chip shortage. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to World Radio Conference 1979, where amateurs got new bands and takes a look at the proposed single sideband 10 and a half meter band. And he will have other amateur radio news from 1980. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, presents the final installment of his six part series explaining how to get your club meeting or ham fest promoted on local broadcast radio by correctly composing and submitting a public service announcement. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our really soggy, due to a lot of rain headquarters here in Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our soggy Catskill Mountains outpost in upstate New York, where General Mudd is removing our barn boots as we slog through the fields and streams, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from a Troy, New York news bureau, where the Hudson River is currently flooding, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where old man Winter has certainly outworn his welcome, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, who says enough of this cold weather. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week is an update on a story we brought to you last week. This update provided by Quest France. A French radio amateur found guilty of making threats, insults, and homophobic remarks on the air has been sentenced to a year in prison, suspended for two years, and put on probation, according to various reports in the French media. He was also ordered off the air and to pay a fine of 5,000 euros, or roughly 5,450 U.S. dollars, and to further pay compensation to two plaintiffs. 
the ham, who was 65 years old, was identified only as Gerard in the news reports. His call sign, which he had apparently used on the air to identify himself, was not provided. The court of Versailles sentenced him on Monday, the 28th of March. The complaints against him included both death threats and a false report of someone's death. He had been arrested a number of times going back to late 2020 when his radio equipment was seized. But according to news reports, he then went on to purchase yet more radios. Another update for you now about a United States amateur that was charged earlier this year with using the airwaves for criminal activity is back in the news yet again this week with new charges filed against him. You may remember the story of Richard Wagner, the Erie, Pennsylvania radio amateur charged with making bomb threats and bogus weather reports over the air late last year and earlier this year, now faces new charges of again using the airwaves for criminal purposes. According to a report in the Erie Times newspaper, detectives in Erie County filed charges on Tuesday, March 29th, saying the radio amateur used emergency frequencies in late March to make threats against witnesses, victims, and a judge who had presided over his earlier criminal cases. Richard Wagner's call sign is listed as N3BWG on QRZ.com. Meanwhile, all but two of the 37 criminal charges in those earlier cases had been dropped on March 3rd, and the bond money holding him in prison was substantially reduced. In the latest development, detectives claim that Wagner made the new threatening transmissions over frequencies used by the County Emergency Management Office and the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. He was once again arrested and placed in Erie County Prison on $175,000 bond and now faces charges of bomb threats and retaliation against a prosecutor or judicial official. We have an update to our lead story from last week regarding the new $35 FCC application fee. With more details on this latest clarification, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, reporting from League Headquarters. The Federal Communications Commission staff has clarified, in response to an ARRL request, that the new $35 application fee will not apply to most license modifications, including those to upgrade an amateur radio licensee's operator class and changes to club station trustees. The FCC staff explained that the new fees will apply only to applications for a new license, a renewal, rule waiver, or a new vanity call sign. As previously announced, the new fees take effect on April 19, 2022. ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Manager Marie Soma, AB1FM, said, quote, We are pleased that the FCC will not charge licensees the FCC application fee for the license upgrade applications. While applicants for a new license will need to pay the $35 FCC application fee, there'll be no FCC charge for future upgrades and administrative updates such as change of mailing or email address. Most current licensees, therefore, will not be charged the new FCC application fee until they renew their license or apply for a new vanity call sign. Close quote. ARRL previously reported that the new $35 application fee for amateur radio licenses will become effective on April 19, 2022. Further information and instructions about the new FCC application fee are available from the ARRL VEC. Belgium's National Amateur Radio Society, the UBA, has joined other national amateur radio societies in banning amateurs from Russia and Belarus from contests. A translation of the UBA post reads as follows. With regard to participation in activities of a competitive nature, contests, ARDF competitions, obtaining awards, and etc., the Board of Directors of the UBA has decided that UBA will support the measures of various AIRU sister associations and regular sports organizations. This means that, until further notice, Broadcasting and listening amateurs from the Radio Russian Federation and Belarus are excluded from participation. For Belgian participants in various competitions organized by UBA, this means that connections with stations in the above countries yield zero points, and they cannot be used as multipliers either.
On April 9, 2019, Finland's communications regulator, Traficom, added the use of encryption to the amateur radio license in that country. A translation of the post by the Finnish Transport and Communications Agency says, A radio amateur license may be issued to a legal person engaged in radio amateur communications whose controller of the radio amateur station holds the certificate of competence required for the task. The requirement that the purpose of the legal person should be to carry out radio amateur communications has been removed from the order. The supervisor of a radio amateur station requiring a special permit shall hold a certificate of competence of a general class or technical class. The amendment does not apply to the supervisor of a radio amateur station whose name has been notified to FICORA or the Finnish Transport and Communications Agency, Traficom, before the entry into force of this regulation. Radio amateur communications are not usually allowed to be concealed. However, two forms of radio amateur communication have been added to the order, which are allowed to be encrypted, and the renewed order allows encryption in the case of the proportion of the message that ensures the integrity of the sender and messages, control communication between the command earth station and the satellite for radio amateur activities, and the control communications of a radio amateur station for which a special license for a radio amateur station as referred to in Section 5 is required for the possession and operation of a radio amateur station. The revised amateur radio rules and regulations for Finland are available online. The National Radio Societies of Switzerland, the USKA, in the US, the AWRL, and the DARC in Germany have all reported difficulties in getting a hold of the paper needed for their monthly magazines. In the US, the AWRL released the following to its members. As many organizations and industries have struggled with supply chain issues, AWRL has been no exception. The supply of paper has become constrained for many reasons, and despite the best efforts of our publishing partner, LSC Communications, formerly R.R. Donnelly, to mitigate those problems, getting paper for the May 2022 issue of QST was a challenge to ensure it was printed and distributed to its members and on time. While other magazines have struggled to get their print edition delivered to subscribers, we were not going to let this be an issue for our members. As a result, we went to paper brokers to get paper to ensure QST would be delivered. Regrettably, as you have probably seen, the paper the magazine is printed on is different paper than the readers are used to, and not what we would have liked. However, we are happy to know that members have been receiving their copies and enjoying them, despite the differences in the latest issue's paper. Please note that this is not a new direction for QST. We have not made a conscious decision to change the paper QST is printed on every month. Even though going to paper brokers is an expensive proposition, the AWRL board and staff will do what is necessary to keep the presses running for our membership journal. We are committed to ensuring that our members receive QST on a timely basis. Even before the current supply chain problems, we were facing the reality that there are, today, fewer printers, fewer paper mills, and always rising costs for paper, transportation, and mailing. This is not a short-term problem. It will require our continued close attention as we manage the print side of our organization. The good news is that AWRL committed to developing a parallel print and digital publishing competency over 10 years ago. Today, all members can access all four AWRL periodicals, QST, on the Air, NCJ, and QEX in fully searchable digital editions. These are available to you anytime and from anywhere. World Amateur Radio Day is April 18th and is celebrated worldwide by radio amateurs and their national associations, which are organized as member societies of the International Amateur Radio Union. With more on this special day for amateur radio, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. It was on this day in 1925 that the IARU was formed in Paris. American Radio Relay League co-founder Hiram Percy Maxim was its first president. Bob Inderbitzen, NQ1R, ARRL Director of Public Relations and Innovation, said, quote, on World Amateur Radio Day, all radio amateurs are invited to take to the airwaves to enjoy our global friendship with other amateurs and to promote our skills and capabilities to the public. Use the backdrop of World Amateur Radio Day to describe and demonstrate ham radio to family, friends, and co-workers. Close quote. While World Amateur Radio Day falls on a Monday this year, 
Inderbitzen encourages amateurs and radio clubs to extend the celebration to include the weekend or even all week. For more information and resources to participate in and promote World Amateur Radio Day, get online and go to www.arrl.org forward slash world dash amateur dash radio dash day. Some radio clubs will even seek a proclamation from their town or state government designating the period to recognize the contributions of radio amateurs to our communities and the overall importance of our amateur radio service, he said. ARRL reports that there are more than 775,000 hams currently in the U.S. ARRL also supports a nationwide network of 2,400 affiliated radio clubs. Radio clubs provide opportunities for newcomers to discover radio and to become ham radio operators, said Inderbitzen. Clubs develop the personal radio communications capability of their members, operating together or from their home stations, in portable settings, and from nearly anywhere. Inderbitzen also highlighted that among the primary purposes of the amateur radio service, one of the most important is to enhance international goodwill. Radio amateurs use radio signals, which reach beyond borders, to bring people together culturally while providing essential communication in service to their communities. The theme of World Amateur Radio Day this year is celebrating amateur radio's contribution to society, and this is especially relevant given the important role amateur radio will play as the current global crisis unfolds. The IARU will list all World Amateur Radio Day activities on its webpage. To have your World Amateur Radio Day activity listed, please send an email to IARU Secretary Joel Harrison, W5ZN. April 18th is the day for all of amateur radio to celebrate and tell the world about the science we can help teach, the community service we can provide, and the fun we have. More information and resources for participating in and promoting World Amateur Radio Day can be found on the ARRL webpage or the International Amateur Radio Union page at www.iaru.org stroke on dash the dash air stroke world dash amateur dash radio dash day. Use the ARRL Special Events Stations listing to find on-air events by entering World Amateur Radio Day in the keyword search. On social media, use the hashtags World Amateur Radio Day and Ham Radio. We hope you will join in the fun and education that is World Amateur Radio Day. The Radio Amateurs of Canada are notifying Canadian amateurs that due to the ongoing global pandemic, it's caused significant disruptions in the international supply chain, and this in turn has increased the cost of living and of doing business in Canada. Even before the pandemic, RAC already faced increases in the production and mailing costs associated with the Canadian Amateur Magazine, but now the cost of everything is up. Each spring, RAC's programs and services usually switch into high gear. This year is no different, as they're currently planning World Amateur Radio Day in April, participation in Canada-wide Science Fair in May, Field Day in June, and the Radio Amateurs of Canada Challenge throughout the year. Behind the scenes, their dedicated volunteers are also working on several regulatory initiatives, as described by the Regulatory Affairs Office of Dave Goodwin, VE3KG, in the Regulatory Roundup column, and in the DARF Annual Report of 2021, in which their International Affairs Officer, Sergei Bartuzo, VA3SB, describes the important role that the volunteer representatives are able to play at the World Radio Communication Conference, thanks to generous donations of amateurs concerned about the erosion of the spectrum. Effective July 1st, the fee for digital membership will increase by 4%, from $48 a year to $50 a year, and the cost of paper TCA membership will increase by 10% from $56 a year to 62 The RAC went on to say that they don't take this step lightly, and they thank all of you for your understanding and continued support.
The 2nd of April 2022 marked the 40th anniversary of the Argentine invasion of the Falkland Islands. On that day in 1982, Bob McLeod, Victor Papa 8 Lima Papa, living at Goose Green, was hearing on a local VHF net that invading troops could be seen in the streets of the capital, Port Stanley, about 50 miles from him. But he was surprised to find that the BBC was making no mention of it in news broadcasts. Bob took to his shortwave amateur radio equipment and started calling out. In London, Laurie Margolis, Golf 3 uniform Mike Lima, had been listening carefully for several hours, sitting in the BBC Aerial Radio Group radio room, G3 Alpha Yankee Charlie, on the roof of the Langham building next to Broadcasting House. G3 UML had some expectation that VP8LP would try to call, and they were able to copy each other. Laurie was then able to pass on Bob's vital information to the authorities. Bob and Laurie have remained in touch ever since, and Laurie is still a member of the BBC's amateur radio group to this day. On the 2nd of April this year, the two friends met up again on the air to relive their contact of 40 years previous, this time using the BBC centenary call sign Golf Bravo 100 Bravo Bravo Charlie. Both stations were good signals with each other, firstly on 10 metres and then 15 metres, despite the recent geomagnetic storms. Their chat was recorded for the archives and a feature about the original 1982 link-up was broadcast on Radio 4 the following morning in the Broadcasting House programme. You can listen back to this via BBC Sounds. Laurie was also the guest presenter of Tuesday the 4th of April's RSGB webinar, Tonight at 8. He talked about his historic contact with VP8LP, as well as the recent reconstruction. There were some video clips from the event as part of the presentation. And you can watch the Tonight at 8 presentation at rsgb.org forward slash webinars. The Amateur Radio Software Award Committee is pleased to announce the recipient of the third annual Amateur Radio Software Award. And that's David Rowe, VK5DGR, and his project, Codec 2. Codec 2 is a foundational project for digital voice communication on HF and VHF. It provides a royalty-free and open-source codec suitable for any digital voice application. With Codec 2, David has made significant contributions to amateur radio by helping to move the community beyond the vendor-controlled digital voice ecosystem and enabling other innovations previously prevented by patents. David Rowe and key contributor Monir Salem, K6AQ, created FreeDV, a program for digital voice communication over HF frequencies. According to NBC News, shortwave radio signals coming from the United States have been sending comfort in the form of music and recorded messages of hope to people in Ukraine and Russia. Using the power of a 100,000-watt shortwave transmitter in Tennessee, two radio amateurs are using the additional power of rock and roll to send some upbeat moments to the people of Ukraine and Russia. Ted and Holly Randall, WB8PUM and KG4WXV, operate shortwave AM broadcast station WTWW, located in a warehouse building from their nearby home. The transmitter is overseen by the couple's son, David, KG4WXW. The studio is located in a small room in the couple's house. Music isn't the only thing the couple has been transmitting. They are broadcasting recorded messages left by callers to the radio station, carrying messages of hope and encouragement to be received on the small shortwave receivers many of the Ukrainian listeners have. Ted Randall told the local TV station, WVLT, these people are listening in bunkers. They are listening in shelters and those little battery-powered or wind-up radios. That's the type of radios they're listening on. As a ham... Ted also recognizes that radio's power goes beyond any mere measurement and wattage. He told the TV station news reporter, if we can touch lives through radio, then that's our responsibility. Dan Maloney, Kilo Charlie 1 Delta Juliet Tango, has been writing on the Hackaday website about how to convert a wind-up tape measure into a portable amateur radio antenna. If there's one thing that amateur radio operators are good at, it's turning just about anything into an antenna. And hams have a long history of portable operations too, where they drag a minimalist setup of gear into the woods and set up shop to bag some contacts. Getting the two together, as with this field portable antenna made from a tape measure, is a double win in any hams book. 
For the constructor, Paul, Oscar Mike Zero Echo Tango, this build seems motivated mainly by the portability aspect. In keeping with that, he chose a 50 meter long steel tape measure as the basis of the build. This isn't one of those retractable tape measures, mind you, it's just a long strip of flexible metal on a wind-up spool in a plastic case. His idea was to use the tape as the radiator for an end-fed half-wave antenna, a multiband design that's a popular option for hams operating from the 80 meter to the 10 meter band. EFHW antennas require an impedance matching transformer, a miniature version of which Paul built and tucked in to the tape measure case, along with a BNC connector to connect to the radio and a flying crocodile lead to connect to the tape. Since a half wave antenna is half the length of the target wavelength, Paul cut off the last 10 meters of the tape to save a little weight. He also scratched off the coating of the tape at about the 40 meter mark to make a good contact with the alligator clip on the flying lead. There are two videos to watch. The first video details the build, while the second video shows the antenna under test in the field, where it met all of the initial criteria of portability and ease of deployment. You can read more and watch the videos at hackaday.com forward slash 2022. The Dayton Hamvention is six weeks away. AMSAT has issued a call for volunteers and could use another 10 to 15 people, regardless of their experience level with satellite communications. 2022 Hamvention is May 20th through the 22nd in Xenia, Ohio. The interaction with AMSAT members, satellite operators, designers, and builders make the whole experience a lot of fun. You can meet or renew acquaintances, exchange operating tips, and find out what antennas, software, and equipment other AMSAT members use. Please send an email to Phil Smith, W1EME, if you are interested and you can help. In Brazil, the long wait has become even longer as applicants waiting for their radio amateur license report that at least six months have passed in some cases, and they are now growing very impatient. Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society has asked Anatel, the nation's regulator, to act promptly and resolve the delays for the waiting candidates. The group is asking the regulator to modernize its computer system and standardize processes across all of the Brazilian states. The amateur organization known as Liga de Amadores Brasileiros de Radio Imasal, or LABRE, believes the system incompatibility has resulted in long wait times that have discouraged candidates from seeking licenses. The Brazilian amateur's latest plea comes in the form of a petition, following unsuccessful attempts at progress during meetings held in person as well as remotely between LABRE and Anatel. John Desmond, EI7GL, reports that Ofcom, the communications regulator in the United Kingdom, has granted temporary innovation and research licenses to several UK amateurs to transmit in the 40 MHz band or 8 meters. On his blog, John stated that Roger Lapthorne, G3XBM, in the east of England, will be operating beginning on April 2nd with a license that's valid for one year. In a statement, Roger said, after a very long wait, Ofcom has approved my 8 meter permit. It permits me to use 40 to 42 megahertz with digital modes, including CW, at 5 watts ERP maximum. I expect to erect a wired dipole that will be directed towards Europe, and expect it to be mostly on FT8, around 40.676 megahertz, with a precise frequency done in liaison with others. My hope is that all 8 meter FT8 stations can be monitored with one USB dial setting, but spaced out. 5 watts should only cover Europe when sporadic E is in play, and we'll try some local CW crossband QSOs, but hope to be on FT8 24-7. Members of the Association of Radio Amateurs of Monaco will be using the special call sign 3A5M to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passing of Prince Albert I of Monaco. Prince Albert was a humanist, founder of the Institute of Peace, a scientist, the founder of the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco, the Oceanographic Institute, the Institute of Human Paleontology, and many other institutions. Activity will take place until May 31, 2022. Operations will be on various HF bands using CW, SSB, and digital modes.
And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I felt, I don't know, what are you, how, how are you feeling these days? I feel, now I'm in an unusual situation because I overshare already. I'm on the air talking to people five days a week, four days a week. So by the time I get home, I feel like anything that anybody wants to know about me is already out there. So I don't use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social networks like that, probably in the way a normal person would to let people know what I'm up to and to promote stuff. It just, uh, I don't, I don't feel the need. It's the same reason I got my ham license, you know, my amateur radio license. I was very excited. I really enjoyed it. Took the test, got the, the general license and got all the equipment and stuff. And then I never use it because I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm already talking to people <laughs> for my work all day, every day. And the last thing I want to do, I know there are people, I know Art Bell, Art Bell, he'll do his, he used to do his radio show, get off the air and then go on uh, and, and, and talk to hams for two more hours. I just want to go home and watch TV. <laughs> I just want to shut up. You know how much energy a simple Google search uses? We don't think of it. We don't really think of that, do we? I mean, we don't we don't go, oh, wow, I got to cut back on my Google, my Googling. <laughs> I got to I got to I got to slow down on my Googling because it's using up a single according to, well, the UK's independent fact checking charity, fullfact.org. A Google search, and this is Google's own estimate, a Google search, each and every one, and how many trillions of searches a day, right? Each and every one could power a 10-watt light bulb for 108 seconds. <laughs> Just 108 seconds. So if you see you see an overestimate somewhere, that's is Google's own. That's a 60, uh, equivalent of a 60-watt LED bulb. It's a 10-watt. So an LED bulb... <laughs> For 108 seconds. Okay, you might say, okay, that's pretty trivial. It's not, though. Add that up. How many searches a second go through Google? That's that's the issue. The point I, the only point I'm making here is that we don't think about the cloud using energy, but it does. It uses a ton of energy, and we're using it all the time. Every time you go on the net, every website you visit, every search you make, when you go to you know, to Google and you type in a search term, it's as if these machines are going, mm -hmm. think about what it's got to go through. Billions and billions of bytes of data looking for that one little thing. You know, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? You go, mm -hmm. and it's, it spins up energy. And these companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, because of this, when they build their big network operation centers, which are just giant buildings, giant tilt-up buildings with thousands of computers inside. They're just little, they're called rack mount because they can, they can, they don't stand on a desk. They sit in a rack and they're lined up. They're rack mount computers, thousands of them, row upon row of blinky lights, all connected by wires. And it's not just the computers. Those things use energy. You know, they heat up. Oh, they heat up. That's another problem. You got to have a lot of air conditioning in there to keep the, I mean, imagine if you put 10,000 computers in a, in a small, you know, in a 10,000 square foot space, how hot it would get in there. So you've got to have giant air conditioning. So a lot of power used up by these network operation centers. And then, and not to mention all the switches and all the networking stuff. And then, you know, you got to pay for that power. So companies tend to build their network operation centers in places where power is cheap and cooling is available, which often means near hydroelectric facilities uh, up in Oregon where it's cooler uh, and, and they have a cheap power. Northern Virginia, for some reason, that's a big, Nova is a big area where a lot of, North Carolina too. It's a, it, so they, they're actually out there trying to find places where we can run these network operation centers cheap. And, and if you think about it, when you do a Google search, it's not just one network operations center. They're all over the place. They're all over the world. In fact, some of these companies have so much computing power on the line that they'll just rent out the excess from time to time. That's how, that's actually how the first online services start. You may remember if you're an old timer, that's funny. I always know when somebody has been computing for a long time, if they're an old timer, if I say, what's your CompuServe ID? And they go, oh, 75106 comma 3135. That's, that was mine. If you remember your CompuServe, well, CompuServe came about because H&R Block, the big tax firm, 
had lots of computers to do taxes, but they noticed they weren't real busy. <laughs> April 16th, it got a little quiet. And they said, we should do something. We've got all these computers. We don't really can't really shut them down. They're, they're churning along. We should do something. So they started an online service called CompuServe. General Electric did the same thing. They called it Genie. There's no excuse for America Online. That's just, <laughs> that just, that just happened. So this is, the, and that's what Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple uh, all do. They, they lease out computing power. Google has the Google Compute Engine and the Elastic Cloud. Or is that Amazon? I think Amazon's the Elastic Cloud. Uh, they have AWS, Amazon Web Services. Turns out, they make more money on AWS than they do on selling stuff to you. Did you know that? Amazon, in order to be Amazon, had to put all these computers together, build these network operations centers. They also had to build uh, fulfillment centers, right? Big warehouses all over the country where your stuff is so that they can ship it out to you. And uh, Jeff Bezos, you don't get to be the richest man in the world without a little bit of smarts, right? He said, hmm, we got all this excess capacity, both in fulfillment centers and in computing, what can we do with it? They created Amazon Web Services, many billions of dollars a year in revenue. It's very profitable for them. For storage, for computing. If you go to a website, most of your websites, most of the places you go are not, you know, if you go to uh, the Washington Post, it's not some computer in Washington, D.C. No, it's an Amazon server, Amazon Web Services server somewhere else. AWS is, even my website, if you go to techguylabs.com, or our podcast site, twit.tv. Those are running on Amazon Web Services. Everybody does. Why would you want to do anything else? Amazon, got, it's cheap. It's got all this extra stuff. And then they had all these fulfillment centers. What else did they do? Well, about half of all the stuff you buy from Amazon now isn't from Amazon. You're buying it from a third party that is using Amazon's facilities to store and ship their stuff. It's actually been an amazing success, not just for Amazon, but just for our economy, because it's a lot easier to start a business. Whether you're going to be a, a software startup, a website, maybe you're going to sell stuff out of your house. You don't have to have a fulfillment center. You don't have to have shipping. You just say, okay, Amazon, you handle it. I'll send you the order. You handle it. And you, you make your little profit. Some of it goes to Amazon. Same thing with computing. If you're a startup, I don't want to have to run a server. I don't, you know, so you can do it on Amazon or, or you know, Microsoft does this. Google does this. A lot of companies do it now with their excess server capacity. It's kind of interesting. It's really kind of powered this modern uh, technology age. We don't think about it. It's it's infrastructure. It's it's the cloud. It's out there. But uh, no, it's the cloud. When you do a Google search, many dozens of computers wake up and say hello. They pull down enough power to power a ten watt bulb for 108 seconds, and they give you the answer. And boy, do they give you the answer fast. Think about that. We just take this by for granted now. But if I type in who won the Super Bowl in 2019, I don't even have to type it. I could just I can ask. Siri, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? Patriots beat the Rams in the Super Bowl by a score of 13 to 3 on February 3rd, 2019. That was less than one second to get that answer. And 108 minutes, no, seconds of light bulb power. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? We really take that for granted. There is a whole bunch of stuff, and it's happening invisibly behind the scenes. Pretty cool, I think. We live in interesting times, don't we? Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? Boy, you know, I've been doing uh, I've been doing this show since the early 90s. And uh, at that time, when I started doing it, you couldn't say technology was all around us. I mean, people had computers on their desks, but the internet usage wasn't widespread. In fact, hardly anybody used it. Email, uh, when I first started this, didn't even go uh, from one person to another. You you had to all be on the same platform. You remember MCI mail? You could only email. It was electronic mail. You could only email other people with MCI mail or Genie or CompuServe or AOL. You could only email AOL people, right? And then a few years later, all of a sudden, the Internet, and you could email anybody anywhere. That's when the changes started. The big change, I guess, 2007, about 15 years after I started. Is that right? Yeah. 15 years after I started uh, doing this show. That can't be right. Yeah, it is, though. Uh, <laughs> then uh, that's when the iPhone came out and everything changed because all of a sudden you had the Internet in your pocket. You were always, always on, always connected. Man, man now, we're, now we're in the world of TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook and the Goog. It's really changed. But that's part of the fun for me, at least. It's not boring. It never stops. And, of course, 
It means you need me even more. I'm here if you need me. <laughs> I'm your tech guy. This week, the president met with uh, executives from many of the big tech companies, as well as the CEOs of Ford and General Motors, to address the ongoing chip shortage. Both Ford and GM have had to slow down lines producing cars and trucks because they couldn't get the special automotive chips now that everything's got a chip in it. <sighs> uh, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, who was was there, said, it's going to be a couple of years before we get our new plants up uh, online in Arizona. They're going to spend $50 billion. I'm sorry, $20 billion to do that. The president is, is chipping in, get it, uh -uh, $50 billion for a chip production infrastructure plan. It's a crisis, but the problem is the solution to the crisis isn't short term. You can't just automatically wave a wand and make more chips appear. you got to build factories. And many of those factories, good news, will be built in, in the U.S., which I think is prudent, especially if we're putting the money in, right? So 2023 maybe before this stuff eases up. Yikes. TSMC, which is a big Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, that's what TSMC stands for, is uh, ponying up $100 billion over the next few years to build plants, including a $12 billion chip fab. They, that's what they call these fabrication and assembly plants. A chip fab in Arizona. Yay. You know, there's a couple of things going on here. Concern about tariffs, but more importantly, concern about the geopolitical situation with China, even with regards to Taiwan. It's uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't want to be completely reliant on manufacturing in China, which most tech companies, in fact, most companies, period, are in the U.S. and around the world. So this is a long-term plan that ain't going to give us any short-term relief. It's not just uh, COVID, by the way. It's natural disasters. There have been a number of fires, three, as, as far as I remember, in chip factories, which have really reduced production. It's also we want more chips. <laughs> We're eating them up like crazy. Was it Lay's potato chips who said, you know, eat as many as you want, we'll make more? It ain't that way with microprocessing chips. They're hard to make. They're expensive to make. And the planning happens years before. So they planned a certain amount. With COVID, everybody, you know, computer sales were up. Tablet sales were up. Even cellular, you know, smartphones were up. Cars started using chips. A lot of devices that didn't use chips before started using chips. Suddenly the demand is exponential and everybody was caught a little off guard. So it's going to be a couple of years before that eases up. A couple of years. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. New bands at Geneva! Those were the good words at the beginning of 1980. WARC 79 was over, and Amateur Radio came out ahead. We kept all of our major HF, VHF, and UHF bands and received three new HF allocations, a 50 kilohertz shared band at 10 megahertz, and two new exclusive 100 kilohertz segments at 18 and 24 megahertz. These were the first new HF bands since 1947 when we were allocated the 15 meter band. The only downside was the time element. It would take about two years to actually receive 10 megahertz and up to nine years for 18 and 24 megahertz. Amateurs, however, had waited until 1952 to get 15 meters. We would gladly wait again, especially for 200 kilohertz of worldwide HF spectrum. Other legal and regulatory news dominated the amateur world at the beginning of 1980. The FCC proposed a new sideband-only CB band from 27.41 megahertz just above CB channel 40, to 27.54 MHz. For this new CB allocation, the FCC proposed removing the 155-mile contact limit, thus allowing DX contacts, as well as permitting VFOs. A non-technical test would be required for access to the CB-SSB band. 
Reaction, as you might guess, was strong and divided. HF outbanders, who worked the 10.5 meter band, were in favor. Unlike the 220 megahertz Class E CB proposal a few years back, they could work skip on this new band, or should we say it would legitimize their present operations. The ARRL and the amateur community were strongly opposed. Many letters in QST pointed out the intrusion of the illegal operations on 10.5 meter band into the bottom part of our 10 meter band. In the end, the proposal was abandoned. The freebanders and outbanders continue to operate the 27.41 to 28 megahertz segment to this day. In January 1980, the FCC approved ASCII, which at that time was described as an encoding system for digital transmissions that is compatible with most personal computers. Packet Radio had received the official government blessing. Wayne Green, W2NSD Portable One, in a 73 magazine editorial, called the FCC action asinine because it only allowed 300 baud. Wayne pointed out that 1200 baud was the norm in telephone operations and speeds as fast as, wait for it, 9600 baud would soon be possible. Novices and technicians got good news in 1980. They could now operate in Canada. In the past, they were not allowed to operate north of the border because Canada had no equivalent license. Since Canada now had a VHF license, that opened the RF door to all novices and technicians. No reciprocal permit was required. In 1980, Congress is considering a bill to allow 10-year licenses and the authorization of volunteer examiners. The ARRL is watching this bill closely and will keep the amateur community informed. HAMS have been looking forward to the launch of AMSAT Oscar Phase 3. Unfortunately, on May 23, 1980, the launch vehicle failed and it dumped into the ocean. In 1980, the ancient amateur archives was 16 years into the future. I started this series in 1996. So, in 1980, what was a history-starved ham to do? Don't worry, just pick up 73 Magazine. Eric Schalkhauser, W9CI, was writing the history of ham radio as a series in 73 Magazine. Also in 73 Magazine, the CB to 10 meter series was still going strong, showing how to convert those obsolete 23 channel CB rigs to 10 meters and, in some cases, 10 meter FM. In 1980, what rigs were on the market? In the field of 2 meter handhelds, the Tempo S1, the first synthesized handheld, was facing some stiff competition. Kenwood introduced the TR2400 and Yesu brought out the FT207R. Both were priced at just $395. ICOM unveiled the IC2A and the IC2AT. Prices started at just $200 with no NICADs or touchtone pad to $270 fully equipped. In response, Tempo dropped the price of the S1 to $260. If you can't afford a synthesized HT, buy a discontinued crystal controlled rig. The high gain, one watt, six channel HT is just $88. The Yesu FT202R, a one watt, six channel unit, which looks just like the FT207R, is only $125. Pace is leaving the ham market and has its remaining 2-meter handhelds on closeout for less than $125. Inflation has increased prices 300% since 1980. Figure out the prices of these radios in today's dollars. Finally, in 1980, did you get bashed? Did you buy the final exam? Will you ever admit to it? What's the controversy? In 1980, Dick Bash, KL7IHP, published a series of books entitled The Final Exam. They were nicknamed the Bash Books. The actual test questions and multiple choice answers were reproduced verbatim as they appeared on the FCC Technician General Advanced and Amateur Extra Exams. Remember, in 1980, 
the FCC exam question pool was not published. The FCC had a general syllabus of rules, regulations, and technical data covered on each exam. The ARRL license manual discussed these topics in detail, but no one had published the actual questions and answers until Dick Bash came along. How did he get the questions? Simple. He would go down to the FCC examination site, stand outside the door, and question the applicants as they came out. Cooperative hams, or would-be hams, gave him the questions and multiple-choice answers that appeared on their tests. Later, as the books began to sell in numbers, applicants would mail him the questions and answers that were on the tests. The books were popular, selling at a rate of 1000 per month in 1980. Dick Bash claimed his operation was 100% legal. He said that since the questions were available via a Freedom of Information Act request, they weren't classified and could be published. He further stated that he was justified in publishing the final exam because the syllabus and license manuals out there did not adequately prepare applicants for the exams. Indeed, FCC records showed that the failure rate at some exam sessions was 69%. Less than one out of three passed. This was before the volunteer exam program. FCC exams were given at the 20 field offices nationwide and at quarterly, semi-annual, and annual examination sites. If you failed, it might be three months or more before you could retake the test. The ARRL and the FCC fought back. QST refused to run ads for the final exam. The FCC began rewording and changing the questions on the exams to thwart those who had memorized the earlier questions. Dick Bash claimed that the FCC used coercion to pressure magazines and distributors not to advertise or sell the final exam. This battle went on until 1984, when the Volunteer Examiner Program was instituted and the FCC released the question pool to the public. Dick Bash ceased his operation. Did he win in principle? You decide. In our next installment, we are going to stay in 1980 and look at four unique public service activities in which amateur radio played an important role. Sadly, in one event, two hams lost their lives. So until then, turn on your TRS-80 and copy all those new packet signals. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio over the weekend, I learned to my chagrin that my shack was not ready for the contest I decided to participate in for an hour. Truth be told, it was probably me who wasn't ready, but I'm going to blame my shack, since it can't argue, and besides, this is my story. It started off with turning on the HF radio. That involved turning off my 10 meter whisper beacon, which is transmitting its little heart out 24 hours a day into the one vertical antenna it shares with my HF radio. Turning off the beacon was simple enough. Reach into the massive cable and dig out the USB power lead that plugs into the beacon. Then follow the antenna coax to the correct switch. Whoops, that's the GPS coax, the other one. There's the switch, now switching it to the HF radio. Why didn't the sound change? Actually, come to think of it, what sound? Hmm, the audio is going into... nothing. Actually, it's going into the audio mixer that's turned off. Turn that on. Then audio at last. Nope. Hmm. Oh wait, the audio needs to go from the HF radio, not the VHF radio that's configured to do some audio spectrum recording. Turn off the Raspberry Pi at the same time, since there's no more audio going into that, and who needs more potential noise? Locate the two audio plugs that go into the radio audio adapter, disconnect the Pi audio, connect the radio audio. Now, which one is the microphone? Now I've got it all plugged in. Still no audio. Hmm. Two of the mixer channels are muted. Turn on one. Radio goes into TX. That's not good. Turn it off. Radio stops transmitting. Sigh of relief. Turn on the other channel. Finally hear some squeaky sounds. Aha! It's coming from the headset. Don the headset. Now I've got glorious mono in my brain. Test the microphone. Nothing. Hmm. Ah, the switch on the microphone lead. Now I've got RX and TX going. Yay! Victory! Now, turn on the computer so I can do some logging. Fire up my trusty... Wait, which tool? 
The one I normally use for casual contesting hasn't seen a new version since the author became a silent key. No idea if the rules for this contest are still current. Fire up the next one. That needs a brand new configuration file, but that means reading the manual and I've got more important things to do. Try another one. Yes, that's got the rules ready to go. No idea if the rules are current, but at least there's no configuration file to contend with. At this point, I'm two hours into my one hour contesting window and I have to stop. Haven't even tuned the antenna and I'm already out of time. Hmm, <laughs> this shack is rigged. Wonder who I should blame for that. Some days all good intentions come together. Other days, they don't. There's always the next contest. Lessons learned. My shack needs a serious rethink on how best to set it up so I can operate daily, experiment, and accommodate a casual contest. Looks like I'm off to the hardware store for some brackets. And my documentation clearly needs updating. Actually, truthfully, needs writing. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo. This year sees the 25th anniversary of the International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend on August 20th and 21st. Several suggestions have been received as to how this milestone could be celebrated, but after much thought, they decided to dedicate it to the people of Ukraine. 23 years ago, two members of the Air Amateur Radio Club in Scotland started the Northern Lights Award, which quickly morphed into the International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend in 1998. Since then, it's grown to become a popular event in the amateur radio calendar. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that lots of solar activity livened up HF conditions over the past reporting week, March 31st through April 6th. Average daily sunspot numbers rose from 90.1 to 94.6, and the daily solar flux changed from 132.7 to 135.3. It looks like solar flux may peak this month at 140 on April 24th through the 28th. Tad reports that since March 18th, he was unable to get daily solar flux readings from the observatory in Pentington, British Columbia. So for a couple of weeks, he relied on secondary sources, which were all in whole numbers, instead of resolving to 0 0.1. Multiple inquiries to the observatory led nowhere, but now the data is back online. He reports that he had to fudge the flux value for March 31st because the value of 239.5 was obviously an error, probably due to a CME overwhelming the 10.7 centimeter receiver at the observatory, do you think? So he averaged the morning and afternoon readings to 149.3. The official daily flux value is always from the 2000 UTC local noon reading. Magnetic conditions were quite active on March 31st through April 2nd. Average daily planetary A index for the week increased from 10 to 14.4, and the middle latitude A index rose from 8.1 to 10.9. Looking at spaceweather.com, they reported 146 solar flares over the month of March and predicts even more for April. They also report that cycle 25 is progressing faster and stronger than earlier predictions. A new sunspot group, appeared on March 31st, two more on April 1st, and another on April 2nd, and one more on April 3rd, and one more on April 5th. So looking ahead to predict the solar flux is 108 on April 9th, 105 on April 10th and 11th, 100 on April 12th through the 14th, then 110, 115, and 120 on April 15th through the 17th, 125 on April 18th through the 19th, 130 on April 20th through the 23rd, 140 on April 24th through the 28th, and back down to 135 on April 29th through the 30th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index now, it will be 15, 10, and 8 on April 9th through the 11th, 5 on April 12th through the 19th, 10 on April 20th and 21st, then 5, 15, 10, and 8 on April 22nd through the 25th, 5 on April 26th through the 28th, and then 18, 12, 10, and 8 on April 29th through May 2nd. And now with the details on how observers think that Solar Cycle 25 is running ahead of where it should be, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting through Southgate Vibes in the UK with that story. An article at spaceweather.com says that new sunspot counts from the NOAA in America confirm that Solar Cycle 25 is racing ahead of the official forecast and the gap is growing. 
Sunspot counts have now exceeded predictions for 18 straight months. The monthly value at the end of March was more than twice the forecast and the highest in nearly seven years. The official forecast comes from the Solar Cycle Prediction Panel, a group of scientists representing NOAA, NASA and International Space Environmental Services. The panel predicted that Solar Cycle 25 would peak in July 2025 as a relatively weak cycle, similar in magnitude to its predecessor, Solar Cycle 24. Instead, Solar Cycle 25 is shaping up to be stronger. In March 2022, the Sun produced 146 solar flares, including one X flare and 13 M flares. Auroras were sighted as far south as Colorado and Nebraska. Multiple shortwave radio blackouts disrupted communications on ships at sea and airplanes flying over the poles. If current trends continue, April will be even busier, so stay tuned. You can read more at spaceweather.com. In this week's Amateur Satellite Report, Bruce Page, KK5DO, offers an incentive to try satellite roving. That means taking your satellite station on the road. That incentive happens to be the AMSAT Gridmaster Award. You earn the award by working all 488 grids in the continental United States by satellite. Well, obviously, there has to be rovers involved to complete the task because some grids have no satellite operators living there. To date, there have been 39 of these awards issued, and a cool trophy is available for those that complete the quest. While collecting your 488 grids toward the Gridmaster Award, you're also building your ARRL VHF UHF Century Club standings. Bruce says he needs about 30 more grids to complete the Gridmaster Award, by the way. If the ARRL VHF UHF Century Club program appeals to you, you might also be interested in the AMSAT Reverse VUCC Award. You earn this award by operating from 100 different grid squares other than your home grid on satellite. ARRL is seeking candidates for job opportunities at its headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. Available positions include Director of Information Technology, Public Relations and Outreach Manager, Social Media Strategist, and others. ARRL Human Resources Manager Lucy Goodwin explained that some of the jobs are brand new positions established to help advance the association's ongoing digital transformation across membership programs, services, and publishing. Some of the positions are responsible for increasing awareness and growth of amateur radio, said Goodwin. A new program area will expand ARRL's visibility in promoting ham radio to the public and through their outreach to like-minded communities. A list of open positions, including the responsibilities and qualifications for each job, is posted at www.arrl.org slash careers. Employment opportunities are available for candidates with or without an amateur radio license. We're always on the lookout for experienced radio amateurs who want to contribute their passion for ham radio to the ARRL headquarters team, added Goodwin. To apply, submit your resume to ARRL Human Resources. The YASMI Excellence Award is presented to individuals and groups who, through their own service, creativity, effort, and dedication, have made a significant contribution to amateur radio. The contribution may be in recognition of technical, operating, or organizational achievement, as all three are necessary for amateur radio to grow and prosper. The Yasmi Excellent Award is in the form of a cash grant and an individually engraved crystal globe. The Board of Directors of the Yasmi Foundation is pleased to announce the latest recipients of the Yasmi Excellence Award. Dan Marler, K7REX. When the COVID pandemic led to cessation of in-person meetings, training sessions, and gatherings, Dan converted a small limited membership Zoom platform to the open presentation forum known as Rat Pack. In the subsequent two years, Rat Pack has hosted over 200 online presentations that have been viewed by thousands of radio amateurs. Among the wide ranging topics, half focus on public service communications, while the rest address technical, operating, scientific, and general interest topics offered by a host of presenters. 
The recordings of these sessions are available for public viewing and constitute a valuable resource for the amateur radio community. Dr. Gordon Gibby, KX4Z. Gordon is a retired emergency room physician turned high school science teacher who demonstrates how amateur radio can benefit our communities in a wide variety of ways. As an Aries leader in Northern Florida, Gordon promotes and teaches all aspects of preparedness for disasters, from planning and exercises to building and repairing communication hardware to understanding official responders' needs, methods, and organization. He advocates cognizance of amateur's role and its limits, building trust and relationships, and constantly improving our individual skills. He is known around the country for his informative and carefully thought out responses to the many questions from other amateurs seeking to improve their local disaster response capabilities. The Yasme Foundation is a not-for-profit corporation organized to support scientific and educational projects related to amateur radio, including DXing and the introduction and promotion of amateur radio in developing countries. For additional information about the Yasme Foundation, visit our website at www.yasme.org. The Youngsters on the Air organization has announced that this year's IARU Region 1 Yota Summer Camp will take place between August the 6th and the 13th in Croatia. The organization has great pleasure in announcing that they can finally continue with the 10th Yota Summer Camp. After the COVID-related cancellations in 2020 and 2021, the Croatian National Radio Society, HRS, has generously offered to plan and host the event. It will take place in the city of Karlovac, not far from the capital Zagreb. There will be time for operating the latest equipment, both locally and remotely, kit building, and visiting the capital and the seaside. Attendees will get the opportunity to see the diversity offered by Croatia. Since there are many nationalities visiting the camp, there will also be cultural elements within the programme, such as the intercultural evening, where participants bring food and drinks from their home country to be shared by all. Youngsters on the Air asks every youth coordinator in IARU Region 1 to apply for their national YOTA teams in a call for applications. One team can consist of up to four participants. For further details, applicants should see the application form at www.ham-yota.com. Just follow the link to Summer Camp Croatia. The final number of participants per member society will be announced after the application deadline of May the 8th, 2022. If you're a youngster willing to participate at this year's Yota Summer Camp, feel free to reach out to your National Youth Coordinator and show your interest today. You can follow Yota on Twitter at HamYota. Amateur radio operators have reunited a man from Kolkata, India, with his family after the man went missing last year while taking his parents on a trip to Kanyakumari, a coastal town on the southern end of India. Hams from the West Bengal Radio Club, who have a long track record of success in solving missing persons cases, were contacted recently by the man's father, a retired customs officer in his 70s. An account in the Millennium Post newspaper tells how Ambarish Nag Bizwas, BU2JFB, club secretary, worked with amateurs in Chennai to track down the missing man. The hams circulated a photograph of him that was provided by his parents, who had been searching for their son on their own without luck. According to the newspaper story, on Friday, April 1st, the man was singing on the street in Kanyakumari, begging for money. A photograph was taken of him and shown to his parents. Only his father recognized him due to the son's changed appearance. The father reported that his son had been prone to depression the past several years. Once his identity was confirmed, the man was taken into safe custody at a local police station to await his parents' arrival. Ambarish Nag Biswas told the newspaper that amateur radio operator Debduda Mukherjee VU3JXA was going to accompany the father when he went to retrieve his son. Kanyakumari is more than 2,000 kilometers from Kolkata. 
Shane Siggins, G6, WBS from Preston, Lancashire, has achieved mountain goat status in the Summits on the Air Award program, reaching 1,000 activator points. He has made the vast majority of his contacts on 2 meter FM. Siggins reports feeling part of a very special community with a loyal band of recognized chasers being contacted on most activations and expresses appreciation to the program for encouraging him to explore lots of new hills and mountains. Siggins has enjoyed the company of his partner on most activations who joins in with route planning, a tenant assembly, and other activities. They are now looking forward to some Summits on the Air activations further afield, including abroad. For more information about Summits on the Air, visit www.sota.org.uk. Meanwhile, just as hams in the Summits on the Air award scheme rise through the tier of awards to increase their standing, so too has the award scheme scaled new heights. For the past month, SOTA has been marking its 20th anniversary in England and Wales, the birthplaces of the program, which now has more than 24,000 participants on all the major continents. During April, the Summits on the Air management team member, Tom Reed, M1EYP, will be operating special event station GB20SOTA from the summit of the cloud, which is designated as G forward stroke SP hyphen 015 in the SOTA award scheme. Additional special event calls will be on the air throughout this year as hams in Northern Ireland, Scotland, and the United States mark the occasion. The celebration kicked off last month with summit activations by GW Association Manager Roger Dallimore, MW0IDX, under the GB2 OTA call sign in Wales. Free commemorative certificates will be available. U.S. Army Netcom will be utilizing 60 meters for amateur radio outreach from April 29th through May 7th as part of Department of Defense COMEX 22-2. On May 3rd at 0200 UTC, that's May 2nd at 2100 Central, there will be a high-power broadcast about the information that will be requested during the exercise. U.S. Army Netcom will also announce times for amateur radio and AUXCOM to net with DODHF stations for the remainder of the week. Beginning on May 3rd at noon local for each U.S. time zone, there will be a short net for amateur AUXCOM stations. In the evening, 2100 Central and noon, local nets will conclude with the noon net on Saturday, May 7th. Netcom will be requesting support for collecting various types of information that may include road closure reports, METAR weather reports, and electrical power service availability. The Bradford Telegraph and Argus newspaper reports that amateur radio led to a career in electronics for Jeff Higgins' Golf 3 uniform Bravo Delta. Jeff started tinkering with radios in his early teens. He said that, after the war, a lot of stuff was being sold off. It was a treasure trove of parts. He used to cycle down to Bearstow's shop in Keithley on his bike. They sold lots of bits and pieces, and he bought the bits that could be used for radios and transceivers. Jeff would mess about with them. He pulled them apart and made new ones. At age 16, he gained an amateur radio license, Golf 3 Uniform Delta Bravo. Jeff said he did a lot of amateur radio and talked to people across the world. With a passion for electronics, Jeff considered joining the General Post Office to work in telephony, but back then he said telephony was just about bits of wire. He said that when you think what telephony has now become, he was wrong. He went to work for Leonard Dyer as an apprentice in Bingley, attending Bradford College, studying TV and radio electronics on day release. At the time, Bradford was a key player in the world of television, with Baird TV in Lidget Green manufacturing the bulk of the nation's TV sets. At one time, it was the most modern and largest TV factory in all of Europe. The full story is available at www.thetelegraphandargus.co.uk. As hurricane season moves in along the east coast of the United States, amateur radio operators will be able to train for hurricane preparedness during a free workshop being held virtually on Monday, April 11th. The workshop is taking place during the National Hurricane Conference, with various sessions being held from 10.30 a.m. to noon and from 1.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Topics include the importance of surface reporting by ham radio operators 
an overview of the Hurricane WatchNet, a look at the Voice over IP Hurricane Net, and best practices in Skywarn. There will also be a presentation on the Salvation Army Team Emergency Response Radio Network, known by the acronym SATERN. The workshop will be held on Zoom. Those who are unable to attend or miss the workshop altogether can view everything later on YouTube. And now, to conclude his six-part series on how to write a public service announcement to successfully promote your club's activities on local broadcast stations, here is Indiana's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In this sixth segment on the topic of promoting your not-for-profit ham radio club's events, we'll look into some hints and suggestions for getting your public service announcement on the air for free. In the broadcast industry, a common business practice is what they call trade. Radio stations trade ads for services. They trade airtime for products and services. Some stations trade advertising airtime for perks like free meals for station employees at local restaurants, free gas at gas stations for ads, office equipment and computers for ads, and more. You can use this to your advantage too. When you are able to create the ultimate PSA script, the next thing to accomplish is to get it recorded professionally, and here's where the trade comes in. First off, it is not advisable to get a present or recently passed local DJ or announcer to record your PSA, since other radio stations are not likely to broadcast a competitor's voice. Unless you have a club member with professional sound gear at home who can produce it, record it, and produce CDs or reel-to-reel -reel tapes for your club, your next best bet is to research trade. Many radio stations buy or trade for professional voice services. They email or fax scripts and get tapes or CDs in the mail a week or so later. You may be able to get your local station to have this done along with theirs at no cost since they typically pay a monthly fee which does not change with usage. Some stations have local folks they hire and pay like 20 bucks to come in and voice some commercials once a month or so. These folks may be willing to do yours, too, at no extra cost. All this will, will require some sort of relationship with a local radio station, which can start with something as simple as inviting them to your next club meeting, personally tutoring them or a family member through your technician test classes and VE session, or a few free tickets to your next ham fest. You could also offer to trade ham fest table space for a professionally recorded PSA for your next Hamfest. Anyway, trade is something common in the broadcast industry, so use it to help promote your club. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. In honor of Queen Elizabeth II, 70 years on the throne, this being her Platinum Jubilee, Innovation, Science, and Economic Development Canada has approved the use of special call signs for Canadian hams from May 15th to July 14th, 2022. These dates correspond to the early summer busy operating season and will be available to all Canadian amateurs who wish to use the special call signs on all occasions, including ARRL Field Day, the June VHF Contest, the Radio Amateurs of Canada Canada Day Contest, and the IARU World Championship. And now, with our final story for this week from Southgate Vibes, here is Steve Richards, Gulf War Hotel Papa Echo. The Electronic Notes website has released a video on the bathtub Morse key used by the Royal Air Force in World War II. It was a sealed key, and this gave it an unusual bathtub shape. Ian Poole from the Electronic Notes YouTube channel said that the bathtub key was developed in the 1930s as a sealed Morse key for use in aircraft with open cockpits such as the fairy swordfish which disabled the Nazi ship Bismarck. However, the bathtub Morse key was widely used in British heavy bombers like the Lancaster, Halifax, Stirling and the like. In these aircraft, there was a real fear that the sparks from the key could ignite fumes of aviation fuel near to the wireless operator. Within these bombers, the bathtub key was used with the famous R1155 and T1154 receiver-transmitter combination. 
The bathtub key is held together by a spring, and when unhitched, the key hinges open to reveal the inside. The lever itself is upside down, as a result of the key lever assembly being mounted to the top section. There is also a leather seal around the hole to connect the lever with the handle or knob. The bathtub morse key has a heavy action, resulting from the V-shaped bearing used. It is not as easy to use as many other morse keys used for telegraphy and telecommunications. However, as most airmen would be wearing thick gloves and there could be turbulence in the air, the heavy action was probably beneficial. You can see photos of the unusual bathtub morse key and watch a video about its use in World War II RAF planes by visiting www.electronics-notes.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940 covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners. That wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio here on our network flagship repeater, K2RHI. We would like to take this opportunity to thank K2RHI for use of the repeater to bring the Greater Capital Area Amateur Operators this informative weekly news service. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world.